Hello and welcome to How Greens Can Get Things Done. My name is Michael O'Neill. I am a member of the Green Party of New York State Committee. I live in Syracuse, New York, and I am the Green Party of New York friendly organizer at your service. And I am here to be part of this weekly live stream series talking about tips and tricks for how Greens can do all the things that we need to do in order to wage effective campaigns, build our parties, and fight for what we know the world deserves, uh, the kind of changes to the system and structures that people demand for real justice. So the devil's in the details. How do you get the message out there? How do you present yourself to the public? How do you give a stump speech? How do you give an interview to the media? These are all the kinds of topics that we'll be covering over the coming weeks. This is episode three in this live stream. Previously, we covered how to petition to get on the ballot to run for office in New York State if you're a registered Green seeking to run for elected office. And we also uh, covered how to table last week. And we had some fantastic assistance from uh, Adrian and Jonathan of the Green Party in New York City uh, that was at our left forum table. And so you got a, a chance to see what that kind of a setup looks like. Today, we're gonna to be talking about graphic design for non-graphic designers. Now, designing something that looks credible, that looks attractive, that looks appealing to people, can be a little intimidating. Uh, even just getting started with the different tools or knowing what the different tools that are out there can be intimidating. And at first blush, if you're talking about graphic design on a computer, you might think that you need to pay for relatively expensive software. And I'm here to tell you that that last part is not true. You can design effective, attractive graphics for print, for online, for other uses, using readily available, totally legal, free and open source software. And there's a couple reasons why you might want to use a free, sometimes called a free Libra open source software, FLOSS is the acronym. There's a few reasons why you might want to use that as opposed to paying for, say, Adobe Illustrator or Corel or, or other software out there. Well, the first one is that the free software that's out there is going to make the barrier to entry just a little bit lower, right? Maybe even significant lower for you as someone who maybe has never done graphic design before. If you've never done something before, it's hard to plunk down, you know, $40 or $50 or more. I can never remember how Adobe does their payment schemes these days. They've moved to like a monthly subscription model. But the point is, if you've never done it before, it's hard to just plunk down money not knowing whether or not this experiment is going to work. So by downloading some free, uh, fantastically reliable, uh, feature-rich software, you are not putting up front a cost before experimenting and, and fooling around with the tools that are available and just trying out new things, right? And that's kind of the overarching message I wanna to give to Greens who have not tried graphic design before is to just ease your way into it. Try to give yourself as much time as possible. Uh, deadlines can be an enemy of creativity, especially if you've never done uh, what it is that you are trying before. And so you want to try something simple first and then experiment with more complex, uh, more sophisticated designs as you work your way up. And simple can be effective. What we don't want is the eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that's just been printed out from Microsoft Word and having a stack of that on your table or having a stack of that in your hand when you're out canvassing as a candidate or for a candidate. The complete eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that obviously was just typed out in Microsoft Word is not gonna win people to your cause or your campaign. Uh, first of all, that's a lot of paper. It's kind of wasteful. It's kind of expensive if you're printing out that much paper for just one sheet for one item that you're handing out. And Microsoft Word is not gonna have the tools that you need to really lay out your text and your graphics in an effective manner, both for efficiency to get more information on say a half sheet of paper or even a quarter sheet of paper, and also in terms of the aesthetics. I mean, you 
could, I'm sure, dedicate your life to learning Microsoft Word, to being able to hack it so that you could lay out half page and quarter page sheets of paper. But my advice to you is that you would much be, you'd be much better off investing that time in learning something like Inkscape or Scribus, which are two of the pieces of software that we're gonna be talking about today. Invest the time in that software that's actually designed to handle something like a trifold brochure or a half page flyer or an online graphic of that kind. Put your time and energy into learning something that's actually intended for that purpose and it'll go a lot further. All right, so uh, I'm just gonna pull up um, my, uh, my software here so you can see what, what we're starting with. Um, first, I want to um, show you um, Inkscape. And so let me transition to that. All right, so I got my, my web browser up here. And right now I'm showing you the website for inkscape.org. That's I-N-K-scape.org. And uh, you can Google it uh, or, or, you know, whatever preferable search engine that you have. And so Inkscape is, to put it one way, it's a open source version of Adobe Illustrator. So if you've heard of Adobe Illustrator before, uh, Inkscape is approximate to that. Now, what makes Adobe Illustrator Adobe Illustrator? Now, I'm going to throw a slightly technical term at you. Adobe Illustrator and Inkscape deal with what's called vector graphics. And uh, the difference between vector graphics and a bitmap graphic, which is what you would use in something like Photoshop, is that a vector graphic can be infinitely scaled up or down. And you, if you have something that's designed as a, a vector graphic, you can make it as big as a billboard or you can make it as small as you need to fit on a, you know, a, a one inch diameter button. And the, and the lines and the uh, resolution of the image will be preserved. The other thing about vector graphics is uh, they tend to produce text much more clearly. And you, if you were design, um, a brochure that has text on it in something like Photoshop or in the uh, GNU image manipulator, GIMP, which is a, a, another piece of free software that we may or may not have time to get to uh, today. But uh, in that, uh, in Photoshop or, or GIMP, that's called a bitmap. And I'm making a decision now, I'm not going to go into the technical differences between why a vector is the way it is or why a bitmap is the way it is. I'm going to let you search for that online if you're curious about it. But just know that like when you take a photo with your camera, a digital photo with a digital camera, whether it's on your phone or whether it's um, on a, you know, a, a DSLR or a dedicated digital camera, that's a bitmap image. And that is not infinitely scalable. You can't, you know, just, in, you know, blow it up and en enhance it by a thousand percent without it becoming really pixelated and having all those little squares and blocks starting to appear and losing resolution and losing the ability to see the features of the image. That's a bitmap, right? Uh, whereas with a vector, you can scale the image up, but, but vector images tend to be much more simple, right? The, they're more clean lines and geometric shapes and things like that. All right, so I hope that wasn't too confusing. Uh, it, it, I, it's a fine balance between getting into the weeds of the technical stuff and also giving you the technical stuff that you need to know. So I'll try to strike that balance here. All right, so looking at Inkscape, uh, you can download it for free at Inkscape.org and uh, they have versions for GNU Linux, for Windows, for Mac, and uh, you can, you just, you just click on the icon that relates to your operating system. So I'm running Windows, so I have it downloaded for Windows and it works quite well in GNU Linux. I used it in a Linux environment for years. For Mac, it's a little tricky. And it's not Inkscape's fault, but uh, the way things are set up on Mac, 
I recommend that you, um, in your favorite search engine, uh, type in uh, installing Inkscape for Mac, and you're gonna have to download something separately. It's called Xquartz, and uh, that's there are um, instructions for how to do that. And it's it's basically something. It's a prerequisite. You have to download Xquartz onto your computer before installing Inkscape. Inkscape needs that to run. Now that's only for Mac users. If you are running uh, Inkscape on Windows, you just uh, you know ins download the Windows installer and and run it, and you're you're good to go. And uh, it works really well. Now. Depending on how complex your image is, that is going to determine how powerful of a computer that you need. If you have a relatively modern computer that's running uh, either Windows 10 or, or Windows 8.1, you should be fine. Now, if you're running a Chromebook, then uh, we are going to go over an online option that you can use for design uh, later. But uh, for Inkscape, that's you know pretty much for like a, a full-on computer as opposed to a tablet or a Chromebook. So you've gone to Inkscape.org, you've downloaded your um, you've downloaded the executable, and you're getting ready to install it. You've installed it, and uh, you're ready to go. So let's take a look at what Inkscape actually looks like. And uh, let me just transition here to um, my instance of Inkscape. All right, so now we're looking at Inkscape. And what we're looking at right now is a flyer that I made last year, actually, um, when uh, Dr. Jill Stein was in New York City for, was it for Left Forum? Yeah, it was for Left Forum. And so we needed a, we needed a flyer to promote that appearance. And oh, you know what? I need to transition. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, now you're looking at, uh, at Inkscape. Uh, sorry for that delay. I had to click the transition button on my live streaming software here. So, uh, all right, so now you're looking at Inkscape. And uh, this is a flyer that we set up for uh, Dr. Jill Stein for an appearance that she made during a fundraiser during Left Forum last year in 2016. This is a two on a page flyer. And what you, I love the half page flyer, personally. It's gotta be my favorite dimension. Uh, maybe it speaks to how much of a geek that I am that I have a favorite dimension flyer. But for me, in terms of balance between economy and efficiency, but getting information out there, a half page flyer uh, is pretty great. So in Inkscape, I have this set up to an eight and a half by 11 document and it's set up so that it's in landscape format. So it is, um, it's set up so that it's, it's width way as opposed to, you know, if you're working with it in, in letter mode, if, if you were actually just, you know, writing a letter on something, it would be, it would be a, in the other orientation. This is, uh, it's going width by height. Now I'm not sure if you can actually see my cursor. So I wanna make sure that you can. Uh, let me um, check here real quick. Okay, good. Capture cursor is on. So you should be able to see that. All right. So uh, the first thing you want to look at is the guides because margins are really important. What do I mean by a margin? A margin is the space between where your content is and the very, very edge of the piece of paper that you're printing on or a cardstock or whatever. So I have these blue lines that are denoting like where my guide rails are, basically. That uh, I, in order for this content to reliably print and not get cut off from the printer, I need to have it in by a certain amount. And the amount that I've chosen is a quarter inch. And I found that for home printers and for printers at whatever copy shop or print shop that you might go to, a quarter inch is a safe bet. And that gives you a lot of area to work with on the page, uh, but also you're not gonna have text or images cut off in, in that area. So Inkscape has guides built into it. These blue lines uh, you bring down by just clicking 
near the ruler and then dragging down and you get yourself a new guide. And then if you want to make a guide disappear, uh, you just kind of drag it back up to the ruler and then it goes away. So for a half page flyer, you're going to want to have a guide at the top and I've set that to eight and a quarter. So when I double click on this guide, I can actually specify the coordinate on an X and Y axis, X being horizontal, Y being vertical, of where I want this guide to reside. Now this is a horizontal guide. And so um, you specify where it's gonna be on the Y axis, how far from the top of the page it's going to be. So when I set it to eight and a quarter, knowing that the very top of the page is eight and a half, because I'm designing for an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, then I know that this guide is leaving one quarter inch from the content to the top of the page. Now, conversely, at the bottom, my bottom guide is set to a quarter inch because at the very bottom of the page is zero. And so if I want to have a one quarter inch between the content and the edge of the page, I double click on that guide and I specify a, a quarter inch. So you just literally just type in, you know, 0.25, click OK, and there it is. Now, very similar for my guides on the, uh, on the side of the paper. So on the side of the paper, I've got a guide on the X axis, right? Because uh, we're now talking about how far you are to the left or right in the page. And I've got that set to one quarter inch to leave a space between zero, which is the left, the, yeah, left side of the page. And then a quarter inch uh, is the amount of space that I wanna leave. And now on the far end, on the right end of the page, I have it set to 10.75. Because once again, I'm dealing with an 11 inch wide sheet of paper. It's eight and a half by 11. So if I have an 11 inch sheet of paper and I wanna leave one quarter inch margin, that is empty space between my content and the edge, I want to uh, set it to 10.75 because 11 minus 10.75 is 0.25, one quarter inch. Now, you might be asking yourself, uh, well, how do I make sure that Inkscape is set to use inches as the unit of measure? And you can set that in the document properties on Windows that's under file, document properties. Uh, it's, there's some different sizes that are already preset. Um, and uh, so you can set it to letter, set it to landscape, which is width ways on top and then uh, 11 by 8.5. 8 and then for display units, I have selected inches. And then for, um, you know, for this, I also have, have inches in, in the uh, orientation here. So, um, all right. And I'm, I'm, hopefully you were able to see that pop-up box. Uh, the software that I'm using, well, let's test it actually. Let's see if you can actually see that. Uh, so document properties. No, you cannot see that document properties box um, from what I can tell. Um, and actually my stream may have frozen, it, it appears. Um, let's see, at least my, my webcam may have frozen. Let's see how things are doing here. Um, okay, got the camera back. Um, and now let's see if you are actually still getting any, um, any movement on the Inkscape. Okay, good, and Inkscape is still working too. All right, we're, this is live broadcasting, people. Um, we're making it work as we go. It's a grand experiment. So, um, back to Inkscape. All right, so uh, the document properties, uh, you're not able to see it in the screen share, but uh, you can access it through that um, file and then document property setting. And just look for the dimension size, the sheet of paper that uh, is, is fit for the graphic that you're working on. If you're working on something printed that you're going to be printing yourself or that maybe a comrade is going to be printing using a laser jet printer or whatever, then you're going to be working with eight and a half by 11, most likely. All right. So, uh, so we've talked about how to actually set up your page uh, for the edges. Now in the middle, if you're gonna have two on a page, then you need to make sure that um, 
you have a um, that you have a, uh, a your middle sorted out such that um, you are able to have a middle guide that leaves enough space on either side of the of the middle of the, the exact middle of the page so that uh, you maintain your margin where you're going to be cutting your paper. So you have an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. If the middle of that uh, 11 is 5.5 uh, inches, right? 5.5 times two is 11. But if you have your text and your content go right up to 5.5, then you're going to find it really difficult to cut your uh, page when it comes time to it because you've got no margin, you've got no space between the edge of your content and, and where you're going to be cutting, which is a recipe for disaster. And in our case, our presidential candidate is going to, you know, have, have something, you know, sliced off of her shoulder or the, the text is going to be cut and it just doesn't look good. So keep in mind that when you're uh, laying up two on a page, you are going to have your middle guide at, at down the exact middle that's at 5.5. And then you're going to have another guide that is one quarter inch on either side of that exact middle guide. So uh, it just occurred to me that your, these guideline pop-ups may not be showing up on the live stream either. They are not. Um, so, all right. So when you click on a guide, uh, when you double click on it, it gives you a little pop-up window and it gives you a place to actually denote the uh, coordinate of the guide and on an X or Y axis. So I understand that this window is not popping up for you now, although maybe I can dock it. No, doesn't look like I can. Okay, so uh, you wanna specify it to uh, five and a quarter because you're one quarter inch over from 5.5. And then you wanna set your other uh, margin uh, for this kind of interior left side you want to set that to 5.75, and uh, that is um, uh, an option. I'm actually going to see if I can add it something so that you can um, see these pop-ups as I'm going along. So bear with me for just a moment. Um, I'm actually going to transition back to my kind of full screen view here. And let's see if I can, well, no, that's not gonna work because um, then it's gonna create an infinite loop. Um, well, you know what, let's just try it. Um, okay, so there's that. And um, still capture my webcam. All right, so this is going to look a little weird for you guys for just a moment, but uh, I think it'll be it'll be worth it. All right, so okay, now you should be able to see the pop-ups as I'm working. So when I double-click on a guide, you should be able to see now that for when you double-click on that on a on a guide, uh, it gives you the option to actually specify using a number where it exists. So this one's at 0.25. And then we've got another one at um, 5.25. And then we've got one in the very exact middle at 5.5. And then one at uh, 5.75. And then we've, you know, unless you're doing a quarter page, which I'll show you in a moment, um, you can, uh, you just need guides at the very top and the very bottom. So, and then where that document properties is, is under uh, file document properties. And you should be able to see now the actual properties dialog. You can see that we're set to US letter. We're at 11 by uh, eight and a half. It's set to landscape mode, which means that the width is up first. And, um, and then uh, we just close that and get back to what we're designing. So this is for a half page flyer. There's actually too much text on this, getting into the actual content now, now that your page is set up. But I'll tell you, having your page set up is half the battle. Having your margins right and uh, knowing what structure to, you know, you, you're designing in is half the battle. 
And from there, it's a matter of um, making sure that your text is clean and you don't have any typos, that you've got your images, and that you're not trying to cram too much, too much into the space that you're allotted. So uh, we've got a headline here. And uh, let me show you uh, how that works. So this is a text box. And you can, you know, when you double click on it, you can actually, you know, edit text right in it. You're typing in it as if you were typing in a word processor. And you, when you select it, you can drag it around. You can, uh, you can resize it. Um, you can, if you hold control on Windows while you drag one of these corners, you maintain the proportions of your of your object, which is important because uh, you don't want to accidentally just like, you know, drag it out and stretch it because that's not good. It's not good to stretch text either horizontally uh, or vert vertically. It, it just doesn't, it's not a good idea. Now you may have noticed that while I'm working on an element on the left side of the screen, that the right side of the screen is actually changing. And that's because this flyer was set up using a property of Inkscape called cloning and we can get into that in a little bit. It's kind of an advanced feature, but uh, you can ignore it for now. Basically, it's set up so that if you change one element, then copies of that element will automatically change. And that can be really useful if you uh, have something where you have basically two copies of the same item on a sheet of paper. If you catch a typo, on the left side and you edit it, it'll automatically apply that change to the right side of the screen as well, which can be really handy. Um, but it's not essential for what you're doing. So the way that you actually create new text items is you, uh, you, you've got your toolbar on this left side of the screen, right? And this is how you select uh, different ways of, of actually creating visual elements in your design. So your pointer is just what you use to manipulate things on the screen. It's how you like click and drag something around. Um, and then to create text, you, you see the little letter A there. You can do one of two things. You can either just click once and start typing. And I'll click my pointer so that I can then grab that. And then you can resize. Uh, you can uh, hit enter to put something on a different line. Uh, you can change your font by, by, by double clicking on a text item, it will revert to the text cursor. So uh, you can change the font up here in the font queue and uh, you can, you know, whatever fonts that you have installed, uh, you, can, you can try out and see what you like. Uh, you don't want to use a font that is particularly cliched or overly aggressive. Uh, I like a font called Navis, which is a freely available font. It's a very modern, clean looking, bold, cast kind of a, a strong profile. So that is, if, if you just have like a, a one line item, then like I said, you can, you just click on your text cursor and then just start typing, right? Now, if you think you might have something that's more like a paragraph of text, you're still gonna use that text cursor, but you're going to actually click and drag and you're gonna draw a box. And when you draw that box, um, it, it actually gives you like a little, a little window to work in and that's just random Latin text. It's kind of a graphic design tradition, but uh, it, it gives you some options for formatting and centering and for line spacing as if you were typing in, uh, it's somewhat more like a word processing document, but you're just dealing with this one little square. And when you double click on that, um, it, it shows you how much space you have within that square. So where I have, one of those um, boxes is, is here. So here where I'm talking about some of our guest appearances at this event from last year, uh, it's got one of these little windows. And, and 
the key is, is that it allows your text to flow from one line to the next. If you're doing all your text on just one line, then it'll just keep going and going until you reach the edge of the page. Whereas here, when I've got it in the little box, uh, Howie Hawkins, his name wraps from one line to the next uh, because it knows that the boundary for the box is, is over here to the right. So again, the difference there is if you, um, so I'm gonna copy the same, I'm gonna copy this text, right? If I just click once and I paste it, then it pastes one long line, right? Whereas if I, um, let me delete that. Whereas if I click and drag when I have my cursor selected and I paste that text, then it wraps according to the dimensions of the box. And it'll actually tell me if the box is cutting off the text. All right, so um, that gives you a sense of using Inkscape uh, to lay out text. Uh, you can justify text, which means is it centered? Is it to the right? So um, this text is going to the, the left-hand side. Uh, so it's all lined up on the left hand, whereas this text down here is centered. So it's, it's maintaining a center axis, which can be a, a bold choice for your headlines or your subheads that you really want to emphasize. And you can have different, you know, bold or whatever. Uh, you can have italics. Now for, um, for font size, generally speaking, you don't want to go below 12 point. Well, actually, yeah, for printed stuff, It'd be great if you can keep your text at least at 12 point, if you're using something like Times New Roman or anything approximate to that. You, you don't want people to squint to have to read your flyer. You don't wanna make it difficult for them. Uh, people who maybe don't have great eyesight or you know the elderly uh, whose eyes are maybe not as great as they used to be, you want them to be able to read your flyer. And so if, there's a temptation frequently with greens to have really tiny fonts that you can pack in as many words as possible on the page. Resist that temptation, okay? You can accomplish more with less text by choosing your words carefully and inviting people to go to your website or to come to a meeting or to contact you if they wanna find out more. So for your flyers that you are printing out and handing out, you wanna have just the essential information and then an invitation to where they can find out more online. So on this page, uh, there's an invitation to go to jill2016.com and uh, if you can put the URL for your organization on there as well, maybe it's just a link to your Facebook, right? And people can uh, access files or whatever from your Facebook page. Now, uh, when it comes time to actually copying your, what you've made, right? So when I do something like this, I am working on one side of the page and you know laying things out. Uh, to get an image in there, you are going to, um, you use the image dialog, which is over, actually no, you don't use the image dialog, you use uh, import image. So what happens is you've down, you have a photograph, a digital version of a photograph on your computer, or you have an image that you've downloaded, and we'll talk about some sources where you can do that. You click on File, and you click on Import, and that will bring up a little pop-up window where you can select the image that is stored on your computer, and it'll bring it into Inkscape so that you can resize it and position it. So uh, you can you know, click and drag images the same way that you can uh, text. You can resize things. Uh, however you want. So when it comes time to copying this left-hand portion over, uh, oh, it looks like my stream froze again uh, on a slightly not great pose of me, um, or at least uh, the, the camera shot. Let's see how that's going. Um, All right, so um, back to that. 
Um, uh, let's see. So you're going to copy uh, this. And so I'm clicking and dragging to select all of the elements that are on the left side of the screen. And you can uh, do one of two things. You can either hit uh, Control C on your keyboard, or you can even right click on what you've selected and you can click copy. And then you click somewhere else and you click paste. And it might just take a second here. And you can see all the elements have copied over. And then you wanna position those within your uh, right hand side guides, right? So I'm using my arrow keys on my keyboard to nudge those over. And as long as that they're within your guides, you're, you're gonna be fine when it prints out. And so that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is you can actually duplicate um, the items. So I'm gonna right click with my mouse and I can uh, click duplicate and then it automatically creates a duplicate copy of everything and it, and it duplicates it where, wherever the original was. So there's a new copy that's actually on top of the old copy right now. So I'm using the arrow keys to nudge this over. And the nice thing is that when you're clicking and dragging with your mouse, you uh, may not be able to um, really be precise with, uh, with you know, just how you're clicking and dragging with your hand. Whereas if you are um, using the arrow keys, it's much more precise. And if you know that your content is already aligned on the page in one way, it's easier just to nudge it over with your arrow keys and then getting it aligned to your guides as you need to the other way. So this would be ready to print. And then to actually cut it, you're gonna to wanna to use a guillotine slicer. Don't use scissors. A guillotine slicer can be obtained for like 20 to 30 bucks at a, um, uh, any, well, you can get it online. You can get it from pretty much any big box stores. A lot of the pharmacies have them. Any local stationery or office supply store is gonna have them. They're the kind that kind of chop like this. So it's the, call it a guillotine slicer. And it's a fantastic investment. Um, for the amount of money, it's uh, really handy. Maybe you, know, you and your group can go in on one together and you can chop through a fair amount of, of flyers with that pretty quickly and get as many flyers as you need for you know, your tabling or your canvassing for that day. Now, the other option is that you can have these printed as a, at a copy shop and you can have them cut at the copy shop and usually it's only a dollar per cut. So if you print out um, you know, 200 sheets at the copy shop, it's only gonna be another dollar to cut it and then you've got 400 flyers, uh, which is a fair amount, uh, de you know, depending on how highly trafficked the event that you're at is. So that is uh, a, an overview for Inkscape. Now you'll notice that what I'm working with here is in black and white. And for whatever you're printing yourself, most likely it will be in black and white, especially if you're doing a lot of copies of it. And uh, when you can afford to print in color, great. And if you're, you know, if, if you're talking about bulk printing at a commercial industrial printer, then you are not gonna wanna use Inkscape for that. You're gonna wanna use a different piece of software which is called Scribus, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. So what we've been referring to is called Inkscape, and that's located at inkscape.org. And now we are going to be looking at, um, at Scribus. And Scribus is available at scribus.net. It's a little bit trickier to install than Inkscape. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be though. Um, so Scribus, uh, you can, uh, you know, Google how to install Scribus and it'll it'll you know there's different faqs for the different operating systems and when you install it it's best to install ghost script first now what is ghost script it's a little app that resides in your computer 
and it helps your computer with rendering PDFs and things like that, which is actually a, an important step that I want to refer back to. When it actually comes time to like save this thing, you're going to want to click save as, and then you can select PDF and it will turn your Inkscape image into a PDF file, which then you can print from your printer or you can send to a copy shop to print and it's going to print exactly as you want it to. And uh, the one thing that you might want to do is, um, is, uh, convert your text to paths, uh, which is, you know, you can experiment with it. Um, there is one last thing in Inkscape that I want to show you before we move on to Scribus, which is uh, getting your elements on your page to line up properly can uh, be a, a, a big enhancer to your designs. The human eye can tell when things are not actually exactly lined up with each other and it can sort of subconsciously undermine your design or the, um, the quality of your design overall. So the way you get elements to line up exactly without like having to do it just like with your, your hand and your mouse and, your, and relying on your human eye, which is imperfect, is you can have the, the computer do it for you. So if I click on, um, Let's see, where is it? I always just use the keyboard shortcut so I can never remember where it is in the menu. Um, I guess it's gonna be on edit, maybe? Um, view layer object, align and distribute. So if you go to object and then align and distribute, it's gonna create this little pop-up on the side. And what you do is, let's say that I wanted this this headline that I've selected to line up exactly to the right edge of, um, well, let's just say I wanted to do it to the left side of this, this Saturday, May 21 text. So I select the headline and then I hold shift and I select the Saturday, May 21 box. And then in my align and distribute dialog over here, Relative to means what is the anchor that you want this thing to be aligned to. So the last thing that I selected, which is May tw Saturday, May 21st, that is going to be the anchor point for my headline to be aligned to. And I'm choosing that I want the left edges of these two items to be aligned with each other. So when I select left edges, it automatically moves meet the Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein over to Saturday, May 21. If I were to um, select this headline again and I say relative to the page, right, and I click um, middle, then it's going to position it exactly in the middle of the page, which is not super useful for our purposes because that's where the cut is going to be. So what I want to do is align it to the middle of this, this left side where I've set up the guide. So I'm gonna pick something that is the full width of that area or very close to it. And then, so I'm gonna click uh, the, the headline, shift, and then this item down here that I know is the full width of the uh, safe area from that side of the page. I'm going to go back to last selected for a line and then I'm going to click middle. And so it aligns the middle axis of this with the middle axis of this thing that I've selected down below. And then it's back to how I wanted it. Okay. So that's alignment. Uh, and, and then you can do a similar thing for distribution. So you want your elements of your page to be, um, equal spacing from each other whenever possible. So uh, by spacing, I mean the white space in between them. And you can do that by using this distribute, make vertical gaps between objects equal. If you select, you know, multiple, um, you select multiple items. So I've got these two, these three text boxes, and then I select uh, make vertical gaps between objects equal then it will make, make it so that the spaces between these items are equal. And that can be a big enhancement to your, um, your designs. 
All right, so let me check on, make sure that everything's running okay with my stream here. Okay, good. And let's, uh, let's go back to Scribus. Sorry for that uh, going back and forth there. So Scribus is at scribus.net and uh, you have a ghost script which uh, it tells you how to install. You don't have to install it. It just helps if you wanted to import certain kinds of design files, which can be handy. And it also helps with print preview. Um, so you can either follow the FAQ and just you know search for FAQ installing and running Scribus. I can also link to this page in the show notes. Um, and it'll tell you, you know, what to do for the different installers. And then also it talks about GhostScript. But you can install Scribus. It'll give you a warning um, if you have not installed GhostScript beforehand. It's really hard to say. But you can ignore that warning and you'll be able to do 99.9% .9 of all the things that you've ever wanted to do with Scribus without having GhostScript installed. So uh, you, you go to the download page um, the Windows download page is, it actually takes you to sourceforge.net and you just, you know, download the latest version 1.46 and then you install it as you would any other piece of software and see our friend GhostScript is, is located over there as well. Uh, and then Scribus, in my opinion, does not have quite the same polished user experience that Inkscape has. I think that Inkscape is easier to use in a lot of ways, but for anything requiring more than two pages, um, or if you're doing something that's like a real brochure where you have text going from one column to another, or if you're doing like a multi-page newsletter, or if you are designing something that will be in color that needs to go to a commercial printer, then you need to use uh, Scribus. And the reason you need to use Scribus for uh, color items that you're going to have printed commercially is that your, your printer at home that prints in color and the printer at like an industrial printer, there are two different kinds of printers. And they're different in the sense that one is using uh, different combinations of inks to create color than the other. So this is one of those areas where I don't want to get too in the weeds of the technical stuff. Uh, but what you need to know is that if you are designing something for a commercial industrial printer, it's most likely going to need to be in what's called CMYK color. C as in Charlie, M as in Michael, Y as in yellow, K as in Kit Kat. And whereas your, uh, your printer at home or the printer most likely at a copy shop that's just like using a, you know, a glorified color Xerox, that's probably gonna be in what's called RGB color. Now, if you have any question about it and you're gonna have your, your item printed somewhere, whether it's at a copy shop or like a commercial industrial printer, just go ahead and call them. Call them and say, hey, do you need my design, which is gonna be in color in either RGB or CMYK. I'm not gonna get involved in spot colors uh, because I found that CMYK has gotten so cheap that it's not really economical to use spot colors anymore. So, uh, right, so CMYK. And it, Scribus does CMYK naturally, whereas Inkscape does not do CMYK. It only works in RGB. So why does this matter to you? If you design something in, in Inkscape and you've got your colors set up to how you want it, when you have that printed at an industrial printer, those colors are probably not going to match how they looked on your screen. And that's the difference between RGB and CMYK. So if you're doing like a commercial run of, of uh, posters or something like that, you want to make sure you get your colors right because that's a substantial investment that you're making. So you want to use Scribus, you want to use CMYK. Now, it's very similar to Inkscape in that you have a text selector and an image selector um, to import images and things like that. You uh, can set your document up to different dimensions. Again, under File, Document Setup. Uh, this is a single page item. On this one, I have a, 
this is actually a uh, 11 by 17 layout because this is for a poster. And so I have just over a half inch on all sides because the bigger that something is, probably the bigger margin that you want um, so that you don't have things going, you know, or appearing to go right up to the edge of the piece of paper or a card stock or poster board, what have you. So uh, the thing about Scribus that I find a little challenging is that when you're working with text elements, it's hard to line them up exactly because they, you see how I like, there's a little bit of buffer area here between where it says democracy and the actual bounding box of the item. Uh, that can make it difficult to line elements up precisely and how you want them. So what I do is I typed out in actual text um, what I wanted this to say. And then when it comes to actually line it up and place it, I convert that text to what's called an outline. And so a, a text item is actually editable as text. Like you can delete, you can type, you can do all kinds of things um, and, and change it. You can change the font. Whereas when I select this and I convert to outline, now this is no longer a like a, a text item or like a, a block of text. What it is, is it's, it's a conglomeration of geometric shapes that just happen to look like letters to you and I. But to the computer, these are um, glyphs, as they're called, or they're just, they're just pure shapes. And so right now they're grouped together, but when I ungroup them, you can see that they are like actual individual elements on the page that you can click and drag around. And the reason you might want to do that is then you can position them very precisely because now when I, uh, when I select this item, there's no longer that buffer of space between the word democracy and the bottom of that bounding uh, selection window. So I can be very precise in how I place this and precision is important. So, um, so that's my tip for if you are using uh, Scribus for, uh, for poster design, for flyers where you're, you want to have your headlines and your text lined up very precisely, type out what you want um, and uh, select uh, the font that you want and roughly the colors that you want. Then make a copy of that or a duplicate of that and then make that duplicate into outline form. And then if you discover that you need to change your text again, you can, you can change the text of the original and then just make a new copy of that and then turn that into outline. Because like I cannot, um, when I turn this into outline, I'm not able to type on it anymore. I'm not able to edit it the way I was showing you earlier. It becomes fixed basically. So you want to um, always preserve one copy of, uh, of your text. So I've, I've copied that and I'm pasting it. And so this is what I would turn to outline. And that way I have this to work with later in case I decide that I've, I realize I've misspelled something or I just need to change the slogan or whatever. Um, and then to manage your colors of, of different items, you uh, can go to uh, item and then um, I believe there's a properties item here. I always hit F2, which I, I want to let you know how to find this in the menu. Um, duplicate transform group level. Maybe I've locked this. I don't know. Um, oh, you just, just right click on it and then do properties. So it shows you where it's positioned on the page. Uh, it shows you the colors. And so 
Um, this is actually, is this actual text? I don't know. If I ungroup this, right, then I can see that this is set to black. And then I have different colors that have been named here um, that are, um, I'm just cycling through different colors that are available. And these are, they'll be set to CMYK. And the way you know is it has that little four uh, square block there. CMYK actually stands for cyan, which is a kind of shade of blue, magenta, which is a kind of reddish color, yellow, self-explanatory, and then black, and because K is on the end of black. Um, I guess they did that because if you did it as blue, you know, oh, sorry, if you, if you did it as B instead of K, then people might confuse black with blue. All right, uh, so that gives you a sense of working with Scribus, and you're not going to like design something mind-blowing right off the bat, most likely. And so that's why I encourage people to download these because they're free, right? What do you got to lose? Play with them, um, experiment with them, uh, collect different flyers and posters that you like and see if you can replicate them in this software. Do your best to actually um, riff on those designs. If you see a billboard or you, if you see a poster uh, hanging up on the street, take a photo of it uh, with your, your camera or your, your phone and, and then you have that to, to work off of as reference and you'll have that as, a, as an idea to build on when it comes time for you to design something. Now, speaking of riffing on existing designs, um, make sure my camera hasn't frozen. I want to alert you to a resource called canva.com. And canva.com is free to use for a lot of its features. And when you, and they actually have their own little design school. So if you go to designschool.canva.com, um, you, uh, it, it actually takes you through all these different tutorials that are really user-friendly, and it shows you how to make different kinds of things. And one thing I really like to use Canva for is to give me dimensions for graphics that I am sending to social media. Because Facebook in particular, and Twitter as well, they have certain dimensions that they want you to have your image be so that it displays properly on their, um, on the feed, on the, um, on the user stream, whether it's in a web browser or whether it is in uh, the app. And so when you log into Canva and you go to create a design, it gives you these different templates for a blog graphic or a poster or a presentation or a Facebook post. And what I like to do is I like to download a copy of that, um, of that image and then use it as a guide for the dimensions of the image that I'm going to create. Now the thing is, uh, Canva only really gives you a few different templates to work from when you're using the free version. But that's the thing is, I'm not actually going to use this to design the actual design. I just want to know what the dimensions are that I should use for my design. And when I say dimensions, I mean the width and height of the design. Canva is really handy because they keep track of those for you when they get changed by whatever social media app you're using. Facebook frequently changes, or somewhat frequently changes, its uh, width and height for images for event covers and event photos and posts and things like that. So what I want to show you is in the, um, in the promo graphic that I created for this live stream, I downloaded this when there aren't any words, you gotta say it with flowers, image from Canva from their Facebook post template. I just saved that from Canva and then I used that to uh, create the dimensions for um, the design for the, the post. And that way you know that your image is not getting cut off that it's not displaying too small for people to read your text, and that it will display optimally in whatever social media app that you are uploading it to. And so in here, I've got 
uh, a design element in the background that I'm intending to get cut off by the actual bounding box. Uh, I've got uh, a headline, I've got uh, a little, little gray background here to make this text slightly more legible and um, you know, using a unified font. And, uh, and then when it actually uploaded to Facebook, it uploads as a nicely formatted, well-proportioned graphic that people can easily read and shows up in people's feeds. So let's see, a few other places that you can grab images for inspiration. Uh, we'll get to fonts in a moment. Openclipart.org is a free open source repository of clip art ranging from you know little cartoon characters all the way to things like um, you know stop signs or pretty much anything you can think of. So if I type in the word computer, it will show me like a minimalist computer icon, a little happy computer laptop. This is a slightly more photorealistic vector, uh, a little warning of someone at a computer, a keyboard. Uh, if I type in uh, wind turbine, let's see if something comes up for there. So you got, a, this is more of an iconic wind turbine. This one's slightly more photorealistic. All of these images are free to use. And what's important is that these are vector graphics. So you can make these as big or small in your design as you want and they will print clearly and sharply. So if I click on this, I go to wind turbine. It was designed by Skeeter 1985. Thank you very much, Skeeter 1985. Everything on open clip art is in the public domain. So you would download this. You don't wanna download the PNG because that's not gonna be vectorized, right? You wanna download the red download button and then you import that into Inkscape and then you'll be able to resize or reposition this. You'll be able to change the color if you want to. And, and work with it. So open clip art is super useful. It has saved me many times. Uh, so uh, let's see, if I go to uh, this other uh, resource here, it's called pixabay.com. And uh, Pixabay is a free uh, photo resource. So these are not vector graphics, these are actual photographs. They're pretty high resolution, so you'll be able to print with them, but you're not gonna be able to expand them to super huge dimensions. But most likely you're not gonna be working in super huge dimensions, so don't worry about it. So in pixabay.com, in the search engine, I typed in environmental protection, and it gives me all these results, right? And these are all uh, free to use. Uh, you know, there are some photos of litter, uh, some photos of, of animals, uh, sort of poetic area uh, photos of, of you know nature being preserved. We got wind turbines. We've got butterflies. All kinds of high quality, high resolution images. This light bulb with the leaf inside of it looks kind of cool. These are all free for use and free for use in your designs. And uh, we got to be better at including images in our designs. Your, your design should have at least some kind of photograph or some kind of image in it, some kind of picture besides text. We get a little text heavy as greens. We've got a lot to say. We've got a lot of ideas that we want to share to people. And we sometimes leave out the images. And it's important to have images because that's how you attract people's eye. It's how you get their attention. It's how your message can be approachable. So make use of pixabay.com for getting images. There is also unsplash.com. And uh, you know I just typed in protest into unsplash and it gives me all these images of uh, images of protest. And so I think this is from the most recent climate march. And again, these are all free to use. They're legal to use in, in your uh, designs, whether online or in print. Now, at a slightly more advanced level, what you could do is um, you might choose to use a design like this as an outline. So like a, you could create a silhouette of uh, a, a person and a child holding up a, a poster, right? And then you can put in whatever you want for that poster uh, and the actual people in the uh, image would not be seen. You would just be creating a, a silhouette from it, a kind of outline that you could use in your own design. And you might use these for inspiration. Uh, you can draw color schemes from them. So that is unsplash.com. So I went over how to get Inkscape, 
how to uh, get dimensions for your social media graphics from Canva. Again, that's canva.com. And you can also check out the Canva Design School at designschool.canva.com. And it will give you all kinds of uh, inspirational templates that you can draw from and also little tutorials on, on how to design things. There's also a whole lot of tutorials on Inkscape and Scribus on YouTube, probably better tutorials than I've given you now. So as you delve into those and if there's something you want to figure out how to do, chances are someone has already explained how to do it. I have shown you how to find Scribus, which is at scribus.net, S-C-R-I-B-U-S.net. And then I've given you, uh, oh, so free fonts. So if you Google the best free fonts, fonts are the, um, the typefaces that you are using in your application. So Arial or Courier or Times New Roman, these are very commonly used fonts that are defaults in Mac and Windows. And you want to uh, use fonts that are engaging. You can download them. Uh, this is a website called speckyboy.com. It's a design website, speckyboy.com, best free fonts. And there's a hundred different fonts here that they recommend for use in design. And these are all for free. Uh, you can use uh, serif fonts for a slightly more elegant look, uh, usually good for uh, if you're something that has a lot of text, like a newsletter or a brochure. And then you've got sans serif fonts, which are um, a little cleaner. They're better for headlines, I find. They're, they look more modern and they're good for online use. So this has links to where you can download these different fonts. You don't want to use more than two fonts in one graphic, generally. I, oh wow, this piece sans looks really good. I gotta try that. You want to use a, maybe a sans serif font for your headline and then a serif font for your text. Uh, serif fonts tend to be a little bit more readable. That's why we use those when it's more text heavy. So again, that's speckyboy.com slash best dash free dash fonts. You can also just Google that. We've talked about open clip art. We've talked about uh, sources of photos. But the best source of photos are the photos that you take and that you and your fellow greens take. So whenever you do any kind of an event, make sure that someone at least tries to take at least three photos of your group together, of you engaging with individuals, talking to them. And that way you have your own photos that you can use in your graphics and you can show people that your group of greens is actually out doing things in the world. And you wanna make sure that people smile in these photos and uh, you wanna use the, Quality of camera on your phone is probably gonna be fine. Uh, iPhones have particularly good cameras. I don't have an iPhone, I've got a Droid, but uh, my Android phone also has a good camera. And if you actually are friends with a photographer with like a real like professional level camera or a prosumer camera, please invite them to come out to your event and take some photos or take photos of you as a candidate or of the candidate that you're helping out. Maybe you can borrow their camera for the day. Just make sure you're careful with it because those things are expensive. So taking photos at events is so valuable and, uh, and it, just for the ability to promote what you did after the event, but then also for future designs, for future websites, future web pages. So again, that you can make your message attractive because before people are going to be interested in what you have wrote, they have to decide that they want to read it. And part of getting them to decide that they want to read it is making it visually attractive, which involves using images and photos and things like that. It's just how human beings are. So that is uh, my tutorial on graphic design for non-graphic designers. I think this is going to be part one in a sub-series. There's a lot that I didn't get to, both in Inkscape and especially Scribus. And uh, there's other resources out there. There's other examples I could show you. Um, this is a four on a page flyer uh, that I created. So in this case, uh, the, it's eight and a half by 11, uh, but in this case, it's set up the portrait. So it's eight and a half by inches wide. Yeah, eight and a half inches wide and then 11 inches tall. And so I've got my quarter inch margins on the sides and at the top and the bottom. And then I also have a, because um, it's going to be cut down here widthwise, I have a quarter inch from the very middle 
there as well. So there's uh, a half inch in between these elements here and a half inch in bet between the elements here um, vertically. And that is how you get uh, four flyers on a page and then you cut down the middle uh, both uh, vertically and horizontally. Again, margins are key. You gotta always leave space on the edges of your paper because you can never make an exact cut. You wanna give at least a, a, a you know, quarter inch on each side of your cut, for, so a, a half inch space total. Uh, this is a poster that I made for the Green Party uh, National Eco Action Committee leading up to the climate march in DC. I got these um, green kind of paintbrush strokes online, uh, just a, a free vector website, had these different paintbrush strokes that I was able to uh, copy in and kind of assemble together. I'm not an illustrator. I don't know how to draw things from scratch, but the way the internet is these days, uh, chances are there's a free uh, you know, open source or public domain vector of what it is that you want to use. And uh, you just keep searching and draw on your fellow green comrades uh, for advice and for help and just keep learning. You'll learn how to create different things. Um, I think I'm gonna wrap up here. This has uh, been a little bit longer than I expected. Uh, I originally imagined that these live streams would be a half an hour. Uh, this one was an hour and 15 minutes, but there was a lot there. And like I said, I, th I think that this is gonna be a series I would, what I would like to do is actually take you through the design of a flyer from start to finish. And that could be a fun live stream to do. Uh, or I just do one as a video and I upload it after the fact and then we can refer to it. So I wanna thank everyone for watching who's been able to hang in there. I hope that this has been intelligible to follow. I apologize for my webcam freezing a couple times in there. And I apologize for some of the pop-up windows not showing initially. Uh, this is a grand experiment that we're uh, embarking on here with these different live streams. And I just want to say that I appreciate you watching and your patience. And I look forward to talking you to you next week on how greens can get things done. Again, my name is Michael O'Neill. I am a staff organizer for the Green Party of New York State Committee. You can reach me by email at michael at gpny.org. Again, that's michael at GPNY, stands for Green Party New York, .org. Michael at G GPNY.org. You can find us online at GPNY.org. Sign up to volunteer. Uh, if you are an experienced graphic designer, uh, you can denote those skills on our volunteer form. We have a lot of candidates who are running across the state for office right now, and this is a great time to get involved. Even if you yourself do not live near someone who is running for office, there are still a lot of ways that you can help out from where you are. If you've got talents like video editing or graphic design, or uh, even if you're just able to make phone calls to be part of a virtual phone bank, that can really make the difference. So we've got a lot of Greens out there who are striking out, uh, getting petition signatures right now. They will appreciate your support. I appreciate your support. Please uh, check us out on Facebook at the Green Party of New York Facebook page. We also have a Green Party of New York Facebook group. There's also a Green Party of New York Reddit group, and I need to get on that and join up with that and start sharing these videos there. And please uh, share this tutorial and these other tutorials as, as a part of the series if you find them helpful to yourself and your fellow Greens. Uh, sharing is caring. That's the only way that they're going to get seen. And so good luck with all that you're doing out there. And I will see you next week at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday for how greens can get things done. Have a great day.